Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O-Culture. That's our name, and storytelling is our game, and our game is only just beginning. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly, the author penning this tale of mind, matter, and spirit. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. You picked a hell of a time to check in because our guest this time around is one of the most prolific authors in all of occultism and esotericism, and he has the best beard I may have ever seen. John Michael Greer is in the house. John is a widely read author and blogger whose work focuses on the overlaps between ecology, spirituality, and the future of industrial society. He served 12 years as Grand Archdruid of the Ancient Order of Druids in America and currently heads the Druidical Order of the Golden Dawn. John has authored more than 50 books, including his latest, the appropriately titled The Occult Book, a collection of 100 of the most important stories and anecdotes from the history of the occult in Western society. This is the basis for our conversation here, but we also touch on a few other things like the subject of storytelling, as well as some other recent material from John, including his book, The Colburn Alphabet, The Forgotten Oracle of the Welsh Bards, and his translation of a neat little number called Academy of the Sword, both of which will make for fine feature-length episodes down the road. But for now, let's flip the page to another new chapter in our occulted story. Enjoy! Hey John, it's nice to meet you. I appreciate you taking the time here. Oh no, this is great. I'm I'm perfectly happy to be on to be. I mean, uh, you know, radio programs and podcasts it's usually good conversation. So I posted a photo earlier of your book on my Twitter and my Instagram. Excellent. And Thank you. Yeah, no problem, man. And a former guest of the show, a, a, a nice young man from the UK, commented on it on Instagram and said that you were arguably America's finest modern-day occultist. So if you're looking for a new line for your bio, there it is. <laughs> yeah, but I have to put it in someone else's. I'll have to, I have to put quotes around that. Still, that's that's good to hear. I thought that was a, a great compliment, too. Um, I, I Yeah. And I was thinking about, you know, I've, I've listened to you speak, you know, obviously on the, the hundreds of podcasts that, that you've done. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. I've, I've read a few of your books, especially more of your recent work. And I always struggle with like how to introduce people when I think that there's just really so much to say about them. And I actually heard a, a new word today. Uh, mm-hmm. t- and tell me if you've heard this. It's, it's sort of trendy in the like TED Talks world, but they right call here. it, uh, yeah, right. They call it multi-potentialite. Have you heard of this? No, that's a completely new one to me. Multi-potentialite? Yeah, yeah. And it's what on know, earth is it supposed to mean? It's like the the TED Talk sort of millennial version of a Renaissance man. It's somebody who has a vast array of mm-hmm. skill and interest and talent and doesn't mm-hmm. really feel like they mm-hmm. have one true calling. There, there's actually another great word for that, which is several syllables shorter, which is polymath. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there we go, which which is also a little less awkward than multi-potential. You know how we are these yeah. days. We have to reinvent culture for some we gotta, reason. Yeah, we got to reinvent everything, no question. Definitely, yeah. So <laughs> I would call you, in the vein of that, a, a multi-potentialite. You call yourself a polymath. We could just stick with Renaissance mm-hmm. Man. But whatever works. <laughs> sure, sure. You're a you're a very well versed guy. But I know that there's one person that's going to hear this that's, that doesn't know who you are. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to be where you're at right now. I know that's a long story, but you know, just kind of but boil the, it the, down for us. The, the really short form is that I grew up in suburbia in the 1960s and 1970s, and was desperate for anything that would prove to me the world was less boring than the media and the schools and everybody insisted that it had to be. That sent me on a quest for all kinds of strange knowledge, which landed me into occultism among many other things. And um, I basically became kind of, well, you know, like most people these days who have any education at all, you don't get it from the schools. You have to be an autodidact. You have to be a self-learner. And so I basically did, and, never, and they never fell out of the habit. That's kind of the short form about how I ended up um, in the rather weird niche in our, our intellectual economy, ecology that I now inhabit. Yeah, yeah. And I've been looking for a guy for a while to, and I don't know anything about it, so I don't know why I'm I'm bringing it up, but I have this, for some reason I feel drawn to like druidism. And mm-hmm. I know that you were involved uh, with 
a couple groups here. I know that you resigned oh, your I, position. I right, yeah. right. Didn't you resign a position within the last couple of years? With oh, a, yeah. What what happened? I I, I spent in two thousand in winter solstice uh, two thousand three. I became the Grand Arch Druid of the Grand of the Grand Grove of the Ancient Order of Druids in America. Now that in three fifty you'll get your cup of coffee, but it's a neat title, and I also have a funny hat to prove it. I had been involved in the Druid scene since the nineteen nineties. Um, that's the kind of that's kind of my spiritual home base these days, simply because. Um, a spirituality that is rooted in the in nature makes a lot of sense to me. But so, yeah, I, I did 12 years. I ended up um, finally stepping down in um, 2015, winter, at the winter solstice of 2015. I had, I had done the work that I wanted to do. I'd gotten the order really back on its feet and so on. And there, I had a successor already in place. The next guy in line was ready to step up and, you know, spend his 12 years or whatever, whatever it works out to be. And so I, st- I stepped down and um, have continued to do other things. Could you maybe just give us a brief sort of overview of of what you know Druidism is and where it comes from, because it, it does sort of lay a foundation for a, a lot okay. of your work. Absolutely. Okay, let's start by taking the word Druidism. That's actually not the one we use. The term we use is Druidry, and ism is an ideology. Okay, think of communism, capitalism, all this kind of stuff, or fascism for that matter. We use that with druidry as a craft, it's like pottery or carpentry or masonry or what have you. Okay, it's it's not what you believe; it's what you do that makes you a druid. Now, the, dru, this word druid means two different things, and we kind of have fun with that. It originally meant was the the priests and wizards and intellectuals of the ancient Celtic peoples in uh, what's now Ireland, Britain, and France. They were around in ancient times. Uh, they got clobbered by the Romans, and they got clobbered by Christian missionaries. More or less, end of story. In the 18th century. There were people, well, let's be more precise, there were some eccentrics in Britain who were looking at the, uh, the options that they had available at the time. On the one hand, um, the orthodox Christianity of the time. On the other hand, the um, emerging orthodox scientism, you know, scientific atheism of the time. And they're looking at that, and they're looking at the other, and they're going, you know, both of these suck. Let's try something else. And they, they took some, some of their inspiration from what was known of those ancient druids back in Celtic times. And they basically decided, okay, we're going to try to do what they did. Not that we know that much about it, because very little survived, but you know, let's give it a try and see where it goes. And that's what launched what we call the Druid Revival, which is a very long, odd story all in itself. It's been, going, it's an, on, been an ongoing thing for 300 years now. And... So modern druidry comes out of the druid revival. Modern druidry is nature spirituality. It, repre- it, it recognizes that, that what we're going to call the divine, for lack of any better term, is most clearly manifest to most of us these days in nature. I mean, I, I, I've long since lost track of the number of people who've told me, and of course this is true for me also, that they don't feel close to the divine when they're inside of a church or inside any other building. It's when they're out in nature, when they're out among the trees or in the desert or on the shore of the sea or what have you. Then they feel that you know, they're, within, they're within reach of something that, that transcends humanity, that transcends our, you know, our, our obsessions of the moment. And so that's really the inspiration of the heart of Druidry, of you know, seeing the divine by way of nature. Does druidry have any sort of animistic principle to it then? Well, that depends on which druid you ask. <laughs> one of the things that druid, no, seriously, one of the things that druidry decided, you know, they were looking at the Orthodox Christians and the Orthodox atheists and, and chucked the lot. The, one of the main problems with both of them was dogma. Okay, if you're going to become a, a Christian of these, these, this various church, here's this long shopping list of things in which you have to believe. You want to become an atheist, here's this long shopping list of things you have to not believe. It's still dogma. Okay, the idea in Druidry is we're not going to worry about telling people what to believe. We're going to give them some spiritual practices. We're going to give some symbolism and some things. We're going to get together and celebrate the cycles of the seasons, and we're not going to worry about what people's opinions are. So, are there Druids who get very deeply into animism? You bet. Are there other druids who don't? Bingo. It's not, it's not about what you believe. It's about what you do. It's about how you live mm-hmm. your life and what kind of spiritual practices you engage in. I can get down with that. I, I think that's why I've mm-hmm. been sort of drawn to it just recently. Like, I, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm still very new to the occult. I've only been, like, really reading mm-hmm. and studying it for the last couple of years. So, mm-hmm. uh, druid is, sorry, I keep calling it druidism. Druidry. I don't know why. Yeah, druidry Every, is something that, <laughs> go ahead. People, people, want to say, people want to say that druidism, and so that's one of those little, uh-uh, watch it, it's not yeah. an ism. <laughs> It's well, my, my apologies to you and to any other druids problem, out there. Not a problem. That's, come on. It's my obsession. It's not yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, the first time that I ever stumbled across 
the practice is it have some roots in egypt or vice versa like do the egyptians get some knowledge from the ancient druids well there's actually if if there was a connection it was the other way around we know that there were egyptian merchants trading in um out in Britain, places like that in very ancient times. We know this because there are the, the, the ancient Egyptians used to make these beads of blue glass. They're absolutely gorgeous. They were a trade property. People wanted them. And they found them in, in, on the side of Stonehenge. So there were Egyptian products being marketed to... Um, did ideas come with them? Very possibly, yes. Do we have an exact idea of what might have come? No, we don't because we don't have anything. You know, we have very little material from those days. Now, it so happens that more recently, of course, as the Druid revival got going in, you know, in the early 1700s, people were going, okay, we don't know a lot about the ancient Druids. What can we borrow from other traditions? And, and yeah, the Egyptian tradition got raided on occasion. I forget where I heard that, or maybe it was just like a friend of mm-hmm. mine that was telling me that Druids were teaching the Egyptians. And so that all this... Nice no- trick. Right, yeah. So... <laughs> But their angle was like all the Egyptian knowledge had actually come from an older. Is Druidic a word? Yeah, Druidic is a word. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, there, now there's a, there's actually some evidence that ancient Egyptian traditions, the, the ancient Egyptian teachings, go back a very long ways. But we know very, you know, it's it'd be really nice if we had documentation. We don't. So it's a matter of hints and clues and following the tra- a very sparse trail of breadcrumbs back through time to try to figure out where this stuff came from. If Egypt was like most civilizations, it drew stuff from all over the place. Think of the number of different traditions that flow into our modern American way of living. You've got stuff from Europe, you've got stuff from Asia, you've got stuff from Africa, um, you've got stuff from every place in the world. And so I, I'm, you know, I tend to think that Egypt was the same way when it was a, when it was a young, growing civilization. Everyone's going, whoa, did you hear what those guys in Egypt do? Pyramids. Cool, man. There's all kinds of stuff going there. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. So in terms of Druid teachings, what what would people who are not familiar with them, how have they impacted spirituality or religion mm-hmm. even in the Western world? Now, the first thing to keep in mind is that the Druid revival, for you know, the ancient Druids, again, they were, they were wiped out, um, end of story. The Druid revival has been a fairly small, fairly quiet movement. Has it had a huge impact on the Western world? Not much. Um, it's had some. There have been some fairly significant creative minds who've been shaped by Druid. And the most important is Frank Lloyd Wright, the architect. His family had, had his, he comes, he came from a Welsh family, and he drew very extensively from some of the materials of the Druid tradition in his works of ecological architecture. There are a range of writers and poets and all this kind of. William Blake drew on this stuff, the, the great, the great British poet. But generally speaking, in terms of the spirituality, um, there are two pieces of advice I would give anybody who's interested in druidry. On the one hand, the, the the joke that you'll get from druids is go consult your local tree. Okay, instead of going, well, what what should I do? How should I learn? No, okay, get out in nature, spend some time out there, quiet your mind. Don't spend, don't let it chatter quite so much, and let nature teach you because you'll learn much more from that than anywhere else. The other thing is, you know, when, when, you've, when you've gotten good and soaked by a rainstorm, there are some good books on the subject. Um, one of the, I, 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 obviously, I tend to recommend my book, The Druidry Handbook. Um, then there are some other books that I've written. In particular, there's one called Mystery Teachings from the Living Earth, which tries to set out some of the basic ideas of the Druid wisdom. Another really good one to keep an eye on is The Book of Druidry by, by Ross Nichols. And then uh, Lewis Spence, had, who was a writer um, back in the early 20th century, Lewis Spence had some really good books on the subject. I'm thinking particularly the mysteries of Britain, although he had, again, he had a number of things. And those are good things to do. Also, of course, you know, read the old mythologies. And that's the, you, the Welsh, the Irish, and this kind of stuff. So mythology in general is well worth studying. People say, oh, that's, that's fairy tales for children. No, it isn't. These are, <laughs> I mean, these symbolic stories express very deep wisdom and if people just take the time, learn the stories, turn them over in their mind, think, okay, what does this actually mean? What does this symbolize? What does this represent? You're going to learn an enormous amount. So let's transition now to this latest book that you've written, the occult book. I guess you really can't the come occult up. Book? Yeah, yeah, I guess you really can't come up with a more straightforward title for it. Uh, <laughs> that's exactly what it is, though. But yeah. I am curious, how would you describe this book to someone at a party? The, the sort of, the sort of um, elevator pitch. The situa- basically what happened, the, the company that produces this, Sterling Publications, are really nice people to work for, by the way, or work with, they have this series of books that cover different themes. 
and they just they have a range of I don't know I don't know what all of them are but they have and they do this kind of thing what they do is a hundred vignettes usually historical vignettes scattered across a period of time and each one has an illustration they got in touch with me and said you know you've done a lot of stuff on the occult you've written encyclopedias on the subject this kind of stuff we'd like you to do one of the books in this series so this is 100 vignettes 100 stories from the history of occultism dating back from ancient Greece straight up through the 2012 fiasco um, you know my own Fool's Day, as one of my friends calls it. <laughs> you know what? What? What has happened? What has shaped occultism? And it has. It's illustrated. I didn't. Fortunately, I didn't have to do the illustrations. The publisher is much better at this than I am. But so each one of these things has this gorgeous illustration with, and it covers base. It's basically a glimpse, a, gl- a glance over the entire history of Western occultism, from ancient Greek times to the present. And well illustrated. You can read it a little at a time. It is not. You know, it's not. It's not a really complex book. And it's not meant for somebody to pick up and practice. It's meant for people who want to know what all the fuss is about. Yeah, that was the impression that I got when I was reading through it. It was mm-hmm. it was sort of uh, it's like probably two or three steps above like occult for dummies, you know. <laughs> I would love to do that sometime. I don't know if, <laughs> if any of the four, if the guys who run the four dummies series are on the air right now or listening to you, but I would love to do something like that because I could actually do something that I think they would like. This is actually a couple of steps below that because this is okay. What is this occult stuff? Before we even get into how do you do it and where did it come, you know, and all this all the various complexities, what is it? Where did it come from? How is it, you know, how is it manifested over the last 3,000 years of history, divided up into 100 little bite-sized pieces? And so it's a really good introduction. It's something you can give to somebody who knows absolutely nothing about the subject, and, you know, they can go, wow. Okay, now I get it. Well, yeah, and that's why I enjoy it so much, is because it's an accessible mm-hmm. work, because you're giving the history through storytelling. Exactly. Like these These 100 anecdotes are just, they're like mm-hmm. the highlights of the history mm-hmm of the occult Mm -hmm. and anybody Mm -hmm. who wasn't familiar with it would absolutely just, they would be so intrigued by the end of it. At least I would think that Mm -hmm. they'd want to Mm -hmm. dig further into it. Absolutely. That's the hope. But also, I mean, there's a lot of people who are never going to be occultists. They're not really going to get into it. They have other things they wanted. They're going to do in this lifetime. That's also cool. But they read this book. They're going to know what it's about. They're going to have a fair idea of, of what, what's going on, what's included, what's not, how things have risen and fallen, and why um, you know, every serious occultist I know of was giggling uh, back in the run-up to December 21, 2012. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, down the road a bit, um, there, um, I, don't, I don't think I should get into details right now, but I've been talking to the publisher about doing some other similar books. So I think readers, readers who are fond of my work um, and like this kind of thing, there will be more. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Well, I mean, shit, you've written like 40 books. There are going to be I've more, written, right? <laughs> I've, I've, actually, I've actually got 52 books in print now. Oh, I thought it was 40-some. Okay. Well, I know. They, see, they, I'm way hey, I, I, have to, I have to scramble to keep my publishers up on my bio. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I'm doing I, – I write a lot of I, – I write full-time these days. Mm-hmm. And the other, the other secret – and I, I'm going to offer a secret – to our listeners right now, one of those one of those amazing you know amazing secrets from the dawn of time. But this isn't really from the dawn of time. But if you want to have a life, if you want to get out there and do all kinds of marvelous things in the world, I've got one basic rule: get rid of your television, ditch that puppy, because then you're going to have four to six spare hours a day. Can you do a lot of stuff with that? You bet. So. At any rate, that's my little that that's my little secret from the dawn of time for everybody, and that's one of the reasons I've been able to write so many books. We don't have a television. Yeah, I still have one, John, but I do mm-hmm. not turn it on very often because well, they're, 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 of the yeah, same reason. Like it I start eats your time. Yeah. Now you see, one of, one of these days you're going to look at that thing and say, you know, I haven't had that thing on for a week and a half. I haven't had that thing on for three weeks. Why don't I just toss it in the dumpster? And then you will find, as it, as it descends into the dumpster, you're going to breathe a, huge, breathe a huge sigh of relief, and you're going to realize you hated the thing all along. And then you'll go on and have a more interesting life. I think the problem is now, though, John, is that there's some sort of like hot shot tech marketing guy on the Internet that mm-hmm. has this analogy of the TV is the radio and the phone is the TV now. So mm-hmm. well, while people ditch their their TVs, that's a great thing. The problem is they still have their iPhone in their pocket where they can still watch well, their Netflix. If they, in fact, they do. You know, have, you know, the latest really hot trend in phones these days is flip phones. People have mm-hmm. done the iPhone thing. They're going, you know, this is really boring. 
this is eating time, it costs too much, people are hacking my financial data, I'm going to go to a flip phone. And this is the, this is the latest hot thing now. People, I, I actually, I have a completely different end of my writing career. I have a book just recently out called The Retro Future, which is talking about what do you do when progress no longer means improvement? You know, when each new hot, shiny thing that comes down the line is worse than, the, than what it replaced. Well, you know, you go back to stuff that actually works. And people are doing that now. So the hotshot marketing people on the internet, they're, they're starting to get really worried because people are just, people are putting on ad blockers, you know, or just turning, turning, hitting the off button and going out and having a life instead, which is really good for the people, but really bad for the marketers. Who would have thought normal human face-to-face -face interaction would be enjoyable? <laughs> the thought of it, the horror. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it also fits well with your spiritual background like we were just talking about mm -hmm. you know i mean just going out in nature reconnect grounding yourself i mean come on like there's there's yeah. nothing better than that exactly well and the thing is one of the other things to remember is that human nature is also nature okay we're not actually we're not separate from nature we are we're biological creatures we've got we've got, we've got bones just like any uh, any other mammal out there hanging out with other human beings is part of being in nature, which is why the you know, druids do a lot of stuff on their own. But they also they, they get gregarious at times, and uh, you know it's uh, a lot of fun can be had, and a lot can be learned from spending time with people rather than with machines, which tend to be very dull. <laughs> well, have you have you ever noticed the video games are constantly going flicker flicker flash flash jolt jolt jolt? They're trying to make themselves interesting when all mm -hmm. you're getting is all you're doing is staring at this little glass screen as little blobs of color move back and forth on it. I honestly yeah, think I... it's one of the dullest <laughs> activities humanity ever presented. I mean, what's paint dry? You can look at the whole wall. You're not just looking at this little six-inch square of paint. I was going to say, yet there are people on YouTube that stream themselves playing video games that make thousands and thousands of dollars doing that. So mm -hmm. it's it's just so weird I, to me. Yeah, I, I, I you know, it's, it's to each to each of their own. If somebody if somebody wants to stare at a YouTube video game of somebody or YouTube show of somebody playing a video game, if that's their idea of excitement, you know, bless them. <laughs> may, <laughs> may they have a wonderful time. I'm going to go out and do something fun. Yeah. And uh, oh god, that reminds me. I I uh subscribed to like a newsletter from an alternative mm -hmm. health and wellness type of company mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. sent me their weekly newsletter today and the subject line was loneliness, a new global health epidemic. And you click through it to read it. And it was like, people need people is the whole point of the mm -hmm, article mm -hmm. is like, people need to connect with other people. Loneliness causes yeah. stress. And, and I was like, well, no exactly. shit. <laughs> exactly. No, the thing is we are social primates. Okay. Like any other kind of social animal, we're not really healthy unless we interact with other other members of our species on a regular basis. And yeah, the fact that they have to send us out in a health and wellness newsletter as brand new breaking research, yeah, this shows just how clueless we have gotten, just how disconnected from the obvious realities of our own lives. Well, how do you rectify the need for connection and partnership and camaraderie with the occult, because that can at times be a very lonely journey. Oh, it is. It is. Well, the thing is, no, if, you, if you're practicing occultism, no. Okay, let's talk about the two sides of doing occult. There are people who do occultism who are studying it, who do not do any of the practices, who simply read, who study the philosophy, who study the history and so on, and that's cool. That's one, that's one very important path, and that's, you know, it's appropriate for some people to do that. And then there are people who actually do practices, who do the meditations, who do the rituals, who uh, you know, um, read tarot cards or practice astrology or any of these other stuff that are connected to the occultism. In either case, this is not a 24-7 activity. And in fact, if you're doing the ritual work, it can't be. You can, you can, stre you can strain yourself very badly. You know, it's, it, it'd be like... You know, if you were a martial artist, let's say, this is a comparison I like using because there are a lot of similarities. If you were a martial artist and you were literally doing martial arts practice 24-7, you'd collapse from sheer exhaustion. Instead, you're going to go down to the dojo three, day, you know, three days a week, work out hard, take a shower, come home, and do something else. In the same way, if you're practicing occultism, you know, you're doing your meditations in the morning, you're doing ritual work, you're doing this, that, and the other. It's going to take you maybe an hour a day at most. If you're in doing really intense work, it's an hour a day. That leaves 23 more hours 
And, um, you know, hopefully you're not going to spend all of those 23 hours, you know, uh, eating, sleeping and studying. Again, that's not healthy. So you simply you, you get up, you get up in the morning, you do your you do your meditations and practices. Or you go off to work or you do whatever else you're doing with your life at that time. And then you have some time that you can spend with other people that you can, you know, if you're in a relationship, you've got time for your relationship and so on. And this is true of everything. This is true. I mean, you'll find this with musicians. You'll find it with martial artists, as I've suggested. Other people who are committed to some kind of, of intensive work like that, you can't do it all the time. So as someone who writes full time, then what, mm -hmm. what's your what's your daily schedule like then? Do you treat it like a nine to five job or what? Well, I, sir, I put in, I probably put in, well, I generally put in rather more than 40 hours a week writing, partly that's because I love to write. But it's not so straightforwardly scheduled, partly because I don't need to, partly because um, I'm kind of a night owl. So I get, I get my best writing done after about 10 o'clock at night. So I'll routinely go into the study and sit down and write for ump hours, you know, maybe four o'clock before I stumble off to bed or a little earlier or what have you. But basically... Because I love to write, I basically decide each day, okay, when are my, when what works, given the other things that I need to do, you know, I do stuff around the house, obviously, I have my share of the chores and all, doing stuff with other people, spending time with my wife, I'm involved in some community organizations, I, you know, I, there are meetings I attend and this kind of stuff, I meet with friends sometimes. There's a lot of flexibility there, and the great thing about writing, of course, is that you don't have to clock in and clock out at those times. It's, you know, back when I was first getting into the habit, when I, had, when I was really having to work on, okay, yeah, this is a serious job. I need to do it the way I do a nine-to-five job. Yeah, I would look at the day and say, okay, I'm going to start writing at this time. I'm going to keep on going no matter what until at least that time. But that was many years ago. And at this point, it's just, you know, when we're finished our, with our conversation, there will be some other things that need to be done. But probably by 11 o'clock, I'll, I'll be on the keyboard. And heaven knows when I'll finish. Right, right. Yeah, I've I've learned that about myself is that I guess first of all, you can't really predict when you're going to have that rush of creative energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unless, you know, maybe there is some sort and like, you know, tell me if you have any thoughts on this. Is it like is there some sort of practice that I could do or that our listeners could do mm -hmm. to get themselves in a more creative routine like at the same time of day or partly it varies very much from person to person. There's a lot the personal element is huge here. The other thing is don't worry so much about about um you know, getting into a creative rush. The important thing is to write. Now, here's another of those ancient secrets for the dawn of time that I'm, okay? The part of your mind that creates, the part of your brain that creates, and the part of your brain that edits and criticizes conflict with each other. They use the same nervous, nervous pathways. If you're in a creative mood and you stop and try to edit or judge what you're doing, you're going to crash yourself. That's where writer's block comes from. What you need to do if you're going to sit down and write is turn off your critical mind and just barf it onto the page. Don't think about it. Don't um, go, well, is that really right? Get the first draft down and it doesn't matter how ugly it is. Just get it down. You can go back and edit it later. And so try, I, I, literally, I've had, to, I've had to tell some people, turn off your monitor so you can't see what you're typing. People who, you know, who went through the public schools ended up with an overdeveloped sense of, oh my God, I can't do this. It'll be wrong. Somebody will criticize me. I'll get an F, blah, blah, blah. They end up really stressing out. And it, you have to get back from that because you can't create when you're stressing out about something. So just don't pay attention. Mm -hmm. Let it flow. Don't think about it while you're doing it. Think about it afterwards. You know, it's like riding a bicycle or making love. If you, if you try to reason your way through it, it's not going to work. Well, do you find that then, you know, something like meditation will enhance that process? It's meditate, any kind of meditation. Well, first of all, meditation is the rock bottom foundation of any, of any spiritual path that's really going to take you any place. If any of our listeners wants to do something, wants to do more with life than just, just sort of stumble through it until they die, meditation is where it starts. That's where the river meets the road. So, yes, meditation can also help that because one of the things you learn by regular meditation is how to focus your mind how to turn it toward one thing and away from another. So if you need to turn it away from criticism and just let the ideas flow, that's a, that'll help you do it. You can also just do it by you know, doing, doing whatever you need to do, as I say, to stop yourself from criticizing yourself. Yeah, I, I've found myself doing that. I will write a couple pages and then go back and reread it and edit, and I, I hate doing it. I just It's mm -hmm. like I can't mm -hmm. control it. But mm -hmm. so I but, just no. The, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so here, here's here's the bit of the the a bit of discipline, a bit of training that you need to do. Don't go back until you finish. If you're doing like a short story or an essay, write the whole thing straight through. 
without going back even once, make yourself. Grit your teeth, force yourself through it, say, later for that. And then after you finish the thing, stick it away for a few days until you can go back to it with fresh eyes. Then you go over it again and say, I see what I could do with that. And then it starts becoming fun. Once it's finished, once you've got the thing, then you can tinker with it, try a little of this, you know, sharpen up that character or what have you, and you're going to end up with a much better story. Editing is half of writing, but the first half is the one you have to do first, and that's just getting something out of the page or these days, um, you know, onto the computer screen. Right, right, yeah. Well, you know, speaking of the writing process then, you know, as Mm -hmm. someone who does write a lot, obviously you also read and research quite a bit too. So Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious for this new book, the occult book, what was the research process like? I mean, I know you're a knowledgeable guy, but how Mm -hmm. did you identify all the events and figures and other anecdotes that populate this book? That's that's a great question, actually. That was was half of the fun. Now, the thing is, I had kind of an easy time with this one because by the time I got to this book, I had been reading and studying about the history of occultism for about 35 years. So I had a pretty fair idea of maybe half the, half the things in there were already, I should, well, I need to do this and this and this. I actually made a list. And as I, as I continued in the process, I was going, okay, here's this detail of the history of the Kabbalah, let's say. But if that's going to make sense, I've got to do these three earlier things so you can see where it came from. You know, here's, okay, here's my, my article on Aleister Crowley, okay, but you can't understand Aleister Crowley if you don't know about the Golden Dawn, and if you know about the Golden Dawn, that will cause Elephas Levy, and then, the, you know, so it filled itself in. I actually had more, more anecdotes by the time I was finished than I could fit into the book. It's a, there's a lot of stuff out there. And yeah. when, I did, when I had to do research, you know, which was fairly often, of course, there are books, there's a fair number of books out there on um, the history of occultism. There's some very specialized ones. There's some very general ones. They're fairly easily accessible. I actually refer to them in the bibliography of this, of this book rather extensively. And so I, I had a pretty fair idea of where to go to. And if I had any questions, you know, there were very, you just do some research, you do some digging around, find, okay, oh, here's a book on, on you know, on, on, the, on Renaissance astrology, let's say. So I can write the bit about um, you know this, this particular Renaissance astrologer or that one or what have you. Here's William Lilly. Okay, we got to know what William Lilly. What's out there on William Lilly? Ah, here's a good book, and away we go. Yeah, I just thought that was so interesting, you know, because it. I was thinking like, yeah, you just sit down, and you make a list of the top hundred things that you think you know laid the foundation mm-hmm. for for the occult, and but I was like, no, nah, it can't be that easy. But apparently, it, it, it is. Well, yeah. I, what I did was I started with a list of about forty of them. And then just started adding things as it became clear, because this is a story. And this, one, of the thi- mm-hmm. one of the things I really, really, really object to about the way that history is taught these days in the public schools is they've lost track of the fact that history is, is about storytelling, that it can be made interesting. It's not just, you know, and, you know, in 1843, so-and-so became the president, you know, blah, 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 and that, that kind of, the sort of droning that you get in schools these days, it's a story. It goes places. It's, themes develop over time. Things rise and fall. Um, interesting, lots of interesting things happen. So I tried to tell this, this story of occultism as a story, as something that started at a certain point in history and, and sort of you know, drawing on older currents, of course, and then developed step by step from then on. And that made it easy. This reminds me, I was having a conversation the other day with a friend of mine who has really gotten into this sort of like new entertainment trend of like on stage storytelling oh, you like new entertainment trend oh well, my god they were doing that it's i was gonna say it's new to the west it seems like the heck it is it's new to this generation maybe okay yeah yeah when I, that's a better the, way to in, in the early 1980s when i was in college you know back back when dinosaurs walked the earth um i took a <laughs> class in storytelling it was through the Department of Library Science. Back in those days, librarians used to study storytelling so they could do storytelling sessions for kids. I don't imagine they do that nowadays, but that was still common in those days. When, when I was a child, my mother used to read me stories out of books. It was storytelling. So there's no, I mean, storytelling is probably the single oldest human art. We were, I'm, there's every reason to think we were doing it before we even finished becoming human. You imagine much of the Australopithecines sitting around a fire and 
you know, in, in East Africa somewhere. And, you know, they, they, they talk about the day's activities, where the, where the Mongoko nuts were good and how they're going to go chasing after the, you know, this, this particular herd of giraffes over there and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, sooner or later you finish with that and the kids are getting a little drowsy and everyone's in the mood for entertainment. And Grandma starts telling a story. You know, this, this is hardwired into our blood. It is in our bones, it is in our genetic material. To listen to stories, to tell stories, to put our experience together into stories. And everybody has that capacity. Everybody has that, that possibility. Some, you know, some people take the time to develop, some don't. But I'm really glad to hear that's starting to come back in as, among other things, it doesn't take a lot of fancy machinery and it's a lot more interesting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I was going to ask you if you saw storytelling itself, you know, not writing particularly, but just storytelling mm -hmm. as an art form. And you sort of answered that during that mm -hmm. right there. Yeah, but it is the, it's, it's the original art form. It's the art form that was there for any other art form was. It's out of storytelling that we get fiction, that we get um, creative writing, we get drama, we get poetry, we get everything comes from storytelling. Probably the first art, the first visual art was somebody scratching something on the ground to illustrate part of a story they were telling. Yeah, that kind of pairs well with something I want to talk about later. The, mm -hmm. uh, is it Colburn Alphabet, right? Is, am I the saying Col that right? The Colburn Alphabet, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's as close as anyone can pronounce it unless they grew up in Wales. <laughs> I did not grow up in Wales. I grew up in Ohio. Neither so, did I. Yeah. <laughs> Neither did I. I grew up in the South Seattle suburbs, there you which go. is about as far from Wales as you can get. But, <laughs> Definitely. Um, no, the, the, Welsh, the Welsh language is a very beautiful language, a very rich language. It has some of the oldest poetry in any European language. It's really hard to pronounce unless you grew up there. Well, yeah, I do have some questions on that later. But, sure. And I just want to tie up the conversation about storytelling. At what point did we either stop telling stories or change the way we tell stories? Like, where do you see it? Does it kind of follow the same path as, as quote-unquote, progress, where the way that we <laughs> tell stories has changed? Oh, thank you. Thank you for that quote unquote. No, it's actually much more recent. Storytelling was very, very standard. One of the things that a lot of younger people don't realize is just how much of a collective nervous breakdown our society had in the early 1980s. When Ronald Reagan was elected president, when we as a people threw away all of the movement towards sustainability that we've been doing for the last couple of, this couple of decades before then, and you know all that crap about it's morning in America, we, can, we, we don't have to worry about the environment, we don't have to worry about the future. Something went really twisted and sick and weird across the industrial world when, when people made that choice, when the baby boomers chucked their ideals down the toilet and you know, decided to cash in the future. To, to have a nice, uh, you know, a well-padded present. And a lot of things rolled over and died at that time. And that was the point where storytelling dropped out of common use. People just, people want, no, no, we're going to make a machine do that instead. I think it's because the stories that we were hearing from Ronald Reagan and, and her, his equivalents in other countries, I'm thinking Mar um, Margaret Thatcher over in England is a great example, those stories were such lies. It wasn't morning mm. in America. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, and all of this stuff that it was he, trying to say it with a straight face was so, was just so difficult. No, no, let's let's get an electronic machine to do it instead because it can do it without dying a little inside every time every time they open their mouths. <laughs> and so, but one of the great advantages here it was very recent. It was very recent. Again, we're talking the early 1980s. That's not that long ago. So there's enormous amount we can pick things up again. We can move ahead or back, as the case may be, and, among other things, take up things like storytelling again. Yeah, well, like I said, there there is a, a I guess I would call it a modern revival of it. I don't think mm -hmm. that's the mm -hmm. right description for it, but it's the only one I have that's right now. That's a great now, description, but... yeah. No, that, that's great. It's a revival. It's something, bringing something back to life. Throw some shock paddles on that puppy, give it a jolt, and get it on its feet again. Yeah. And what a marvelous thing to do. I, I did not know that was going on. I am absolutely thrilled. Because um, just to, to reiterate, to, to return briefly to the other book I mentioned, um, The Retro Future, one of its main themes is exactly that point of going back and reviving things that work better than what we've got now. Well, you do see that trend, uh, even in technology, yeah. where, yeah, like you have this, this retro video gaming has been hot for the last, like, five to seven exactly. years. It's more fun. Now, here's the thing. You want to really shock the, sh shock the socks off of someone? Card games. Oh, I love sitting card around games. a table. Yeah, exactly. Sitting around a table with a deck of cards and 
having a grand old time. You're there having FaceTime with other people, throwing a couple of beers, and you basically got a party. And it's more fun. It's more entertaining than just sitting there by yourself in a darkened room, um, giving your thumb repetitive stress injury because you're, you know, that's all you're moving. <laughs> Certainly you're not moving your brain cells. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, it's, it's great that that's being revived. And it's great that um, it's one of the other things that's going on right now. Do you remember a few years ago when um, e-books really hit the big time and all of the publishers and all the, the tech geeks were insisting, oh, pretty soon the printed book is just going to be <laughs> completely swept away. Nobody's going to buy printed books anymore. Guess what? Sales of e-readers um, plateaued some years ago. This is about five years ago. They plateaued and have been declining steadily since then. People are going, you know, yeah, it's nice to have an e-reader sometimes. It's nice when you're traveling or what have you. I want my books. I want that physical. The other thing, the physical can itself be beautiful. It's also, of course, you want to have the book. You have the book. Uh, the can just take it away from you suddenly, as they can with any e-book. And you can lend it to somebody if you're so if you're, you're sufficiently ra or rash to do that. You can mm -hmm. you can lend it to people. You can show it to people. It's a completely different thing. It's yours. Yeah. It's not just this electronic presence there. And so sales of ordinary printed books have, you know, they did that slump after the e-readers came on. Sales of ordinary printed books are on the upswing again. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, if you like technology in the first place, you know, I mean, just going back to that mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. so I, th I think it's well, a good sign that, that we do crave simpler things, you know? Mm -hmm. One of the things that we get here is this idea, there's this word technology. And people use it as though they're just one thing. It's one huge black box. And that's exactly wrong, because what we have are technologies, plural. And we can pick and choose among what technologies we like. This, now, that is heresy. That is blasphemy <laughs> it, to the eyes of the marketers. Now, they hate that. They say, you know, you, you need to be up to date and now and now we and modern and all this kind of stuff. And therefore, you need to buy whatever we want to sell you. Increasingly, people are going, screw that. Um, no. I want this. I'm not going to get. I'm not going to get an iPhone. It's a waste of my time. I'm going to get a flip phone if I need a cell phone at all. You know, I want an internet connection, or in my case, I need an internet connection because my, um, publishers need to be able to get in touch with me, and they want things. They want manuscripts electronically these days. But there's a lot of technology I don't have. I don't want. I don't miss. I certainly don't need. And so the future land, I think, not with people going well. You know, we have to be modern or have to go back, but. With a smorgasbord approach, here's a buffet of technologies. I think I'm going to take one of these and one of those over there, and that whole thing, yeah, that doesn't look very good. And fill your plate with what you want, rather than letting some marketing jerk tell you what you have to do. Yeah, I uh, I actually have a day job in, in marketing, so I, I feel like a jerk most mm. days, to be honest. Uh, but... My apologies. <laughs> no, no, no. No, people that have, have heard my podcast up to this point, they know how much I, I loathe the industry that I work in and... It's the mm -hmm. reason I started podcasting because I, I, I'm trying to find a way out, man. You know, I just want to get out okay, of it. Okay, good, good. Yeah. No, I understand that. I, when, I, when I was in my, the last couple of years of high school, I already knew I wanted to write for a living. And I also knew that it was going to be a long, hard road. And so I did a lot of various you know, jobs that I did not like that I could, be, I could just about stomach in order to pay the bills until I, got, until I built my writing career far enough that I could actually support myself that way. And um, nod to the other partner in the sketch, my wife had a, had a, um, had, has had um, actually a range of jobs as office manager, um, secretary, bookkeeper, things like that. And so she did a lot to make that possible. But yeah, it was nice to be able to just hand in my, give, my, give notice, and walk. Yeah. My God, it was nice. <laughs> that right there, that has to be the American dream. I mean, mm -hmm. these day, the act, that's a really good point. Yeah, the American dream used to be, you know, you're going to go to work and work hard and, you know, and, and make your pile. Nowadays, it's handing in your handing in your two weeks notice and walking away. That's the new American dream. <laughs> what a yeah. mess we have made that that's the highest thing most people want. Hey, I'm only 33 years old, but I've been in the workforce for, you know, 10 or so years now. And I, mm -hmm. I tell you, man. Every job I've held, I've held about a handful of jobs in life. I change jobs because mm -hmm. I just get bored, right? But I, yeah. But mm -hmm. everybody I've met on some level is suffering. They're miserable. Mm -hmm. Yet yeah. they they stay yeah. there. They stay in these situations, and I don't I don't get it. 
I, I, I wonder whether it's because they don't think there's anything better out there. Possibly. But, you know, you're absolutely right. One of the things, people talk about progress. They talk about, you know, this glorious new world of the future that we're all going to blah, blah, blah. What has progress brought us over the last couple of centuries? A world of miserable jobs. A world where when you find somebody who actually does something they like to do, and I, 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 that, that's true of me and I know how lucky I am, it's one in a million. Most people out there, they're miserable in their jobs. They're miserable in their everyday life. They have to numb their misery by staring at a television for four hours until they pass out. We've made a world that sucks. And maybe we need to look at that honestly and say, yeah, maybe that was a bad idea. Maybe the choices we made that landed us here were dumb choices. Maybe we need to stop and look back and look this way and look that way and say, how about we try something different because what we've done doesn't work. Yeah, and John, to be honest, I think that's why I've been drawn to Mm -hmm. the occult, to occult philosophies, is just that Mm -hmm. it does make me feel like there's more to me than I've given Mm -hmm. myself credit for the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's that's a very important part of occultism, because especially nowadays, although this is true of most societies, but especially modern industrial society, teaches us that we're only supposed to develop this tiny little corner of our potential. Specifically, the corner that will make money for the for our employers, and that's supposed to be life. And we're one of my teachers used to say that we are every single human being has some capacity for magnificence, not not just for adequacy, not just for stumbling blindly through the day, but for magnificence. And it may be in any number of things. It's probably not the same for any two people, but there's something that you can do magnificently. There's something that there's at least one thing that everybody can that anybody can do, and it'll be different for every person. But our society teaches us not to look to that. Our society teaches us to ignore that and to do to say instead, "What can I do so my employer will give me a paycheck?" And what, again, what a miserable way to live, to lead a life. One of the things that occultism teaches is that we are more. We are more than robots doing jobs. And we have the capacity to be much, much more than we've let ourselves be. Yeah, I mean, I could not have said that better, man. That's exactly why I like talking to guys like you because you get it, you know, and you're so positive. I've been there, been there. When I was was really, you know, had gone past just getting my feet damp and was getting seriously into this, I knew some guys who, um, some people actually of both genders, who got it and who helped me a lot along those same lines saying, yeah, you're, you're not wrong. Keep on going keep on doing it you're on you know you're getting hot <laughs> <laughs> awesome man well hey uh, let's go yeah. back to your book for a few minutes mm-hmm. you open the book with a, a great observation about things that are considered occult in the modern western world and how those same things are viewed across the rest of the world in other cultures why is mm-hmm. there such a different view in the west and, you know why are certain occult topics so taboo here that's a heck of a good question it's a, i think the answer is probably very complex but there's a lot of history there. But it, it is a funny thing that things that are part of ordinary daily life in most other societies in the Western world, we ghettoize as occultism. Um, here's an example. My, my stepfamily is Japanese-American, so I think of, I, I have a lot of exposure to Japanese culture, and that's a good example. If you go to a Shinto shrine in Japan, okay, and, you know, it's, it's, in a certain sense, it's like going to church, but it's not because you know you go to the shrine you pray you do the usual stuff and then you can like buy a talisman to bless your car they have talismans and amulets they will do divinations for you it's as though you were to walk into a um a christian church here in the united states and there was somebody in the church who would read tarot cards for you and there's somebody else who would do you a mojo bag to protect your car from accidents and things like that we can hardly imagine that most of the world business as usual most of the world, grandma does spells. Everyone knows that you go to grandma when you know because you need some, a spell cast. Here, oh no, the devil, the devil! People are panicked about it. And why should we be so terrified about something? I think partly it's partly it goes back to um, well, to Christianity really, which got this really weird sideways notion about, about things like occultism. And the thing is, there's a lot of Christian occultism out there. There always has been. But the main, the mainstream religious bodies are, no, 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 you can't do that. All you can do is fall on your knees and pray. Don't you dare do anything else or we'll burn you at the stake. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, it's like, it's really, frankly, like the attitude towards sex, which here again is the same way. In most of the world, 
sex is not a big deal. It's something that people do. And are there moral issues that relate to it? Sure. But that's not the be-all and end-all. People don't spend all their time getting bent or saying, oh, my God, these people over there 200 miles from us are having a good time. We must be outraged. And yet it's hard to find anything else here in the Western world up until quite recently. So there's, there's something gone very haywire in the attitudes toward spirituality, the attitudes toward religion, and so on. And then more recently, of course, since we got um, scientific atheism coming in, beginning in the 18th century, you had all these people insisting, you know, there is nothing but matter. Well, how do you know? Because there's nothing but matter. It's circular reasoning? Oh, yes. But they're powerful. They've got a lot of political influence, they've got a lot of clout, and they can yell you down. And if you, of course, ma you know, magic is a problem if you're trying to defend an atheist, uh, you know, materialist worldview, because it works. And so <laughs> yeah. since they can't make it not work, they can yell like, like anything and shout you down. And so between those two things, between the religious prejudices on the one hand and the scientific materialist prejudices on the other, we've ended up with this really weird situation where something that's an ordinary part of life in most of the world you can't even talk about in, in, you know, the, in, the, in the modern industrial Western nations without people you know, falling over themselves. And if they're, if they're religious, they're going to be yelling, oh, the devil, the devil. And if they're um, atheists, they're going to be yelling, oh, delusion, delusion. You know, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want to go back to the point you made about sex real quick because I had a question on that. Yeah. Uh, I was having a conversation earlier today, actually, with someone about mm -hmm. the over-sexualization that's found in Western culture specifically. And I was just mm -hmm. wondering, you know, what, what do you make of that? Because, you know, sex, when you read about the occult, sex does play a role in it in terms of, you know, embracing sexuality on some level. Yeah. But there has mm -hmm. to be a line there between that in a healthy way and then mm -hmm. over-sexualizing everything, right? Well, the, the over-sexualizing, when you repress something, you crank the volume up to 10, okay? Freud wrote about the return of the repressed. Whatever you repressed comes back around the other side and whomps you. And so the Victorian period, when people were incredibly distressed about sexuality, was the most sex-mad period. In Western history, people couldn't think of anything else because they were so busy trying not to think of it. In a society where sex is not a big deal, where it is not repressed, where it is not, you know, it's not a big deal. It's something that people do. And it's something that you can use in, um, the, 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 where references to it aren't shocking and obscene. In ancient Greece and also in modern Japan, this is an interesting parallel between the two of the old nature religions here, there are certain festivals where, you know, in both places where they would take big wooden penises and walk them down the street as an emblem of fertility. And nobody giggled and nobody was shocked. You know, penises are, they, they, they're something, they exist. Um, they have certain functions, you know, <laughs> yeah. no more shocking and um, tremendous than if you paraded, you know, a wooden gallbladder down the street or something. But yeah, what you repress always comes back at you. And in the same way, the fact that, you know, people vary in their sexual activities. You get, you get people who are straight, you get people who are gay, you get people who are asexual, you, get people, you know, that's not a big deal in most other cultures. We, because, you know, we've got these hang-ups, we get all bent out of shape about it, and then we, we over-sexualize everything. Again, the return of the repressed. Yeah, that's a good point, man. I'm glad that you brought that up. I have heard that mm -hmm. previously, but you know, it's just something that mm -hmm. you don't really think about every day. You know, like I yeah. get on, I get on the internet. I don't know. There's and... a lot. There's a lot of people who apparently think about sex. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's true. I guess I I meant more from a uh, you know from a philosophical point of view. Like mm -hmm. like why is this so prevalent? But then there's also people mm -hmm. that have a huge problem with it at the, at the same time. And and that's exactly why it's so prevalent. There is there's actually there's a magical a magical axiom you might find interesting here. What you contemplate, you imitate. Okay, whatever you're fixated on, whatever you're spending all your time thinking about, you will imitate. This is why it's a really bad idea to spend all your time brooding over those bad people over there doing that bad thing because you'll imitate them. Mm. You ever wanted to know why so many atheists act like fundamentalists? Well, yeah, because cause... the atheists are busy brooding over those evil fundamentalists, so they imitate them. They're fundamentalists too, in their own way. Just exactly, uh, exactly. on the other side of the coin. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, they've spent so much time brooding and mulling and fixating and obsessing over, you know, the evils of religion that they've ended up copying them. And the thing is, if they talked to um, a competent occultist, the occultist would say, don't do that, don't go there. Uh, you know, there's lots of other things you can think about that will actually help you. This is not one of them. But, you know, atheists are not going to go to an occultist and ask their advice, so they really didn't have a chance, I suppose. Right, right. Yeah, I heard a good analogy when I used to, I used to watch sports a lot. I don't anymore. That's part of me turning mm-hmm. off my TV. I just don't, I just don't care. But I heard a good analogy several years ago that somebody threw out about the Yankees in baseball were just this dynasty for a long time, right? Mm-hmm. And then the Boston Red Sox, you know, they've been suffering from this curse of the Bambino, you know, it goes back to Babe Ruth, like the early 1900s, right? Where and they mm-hmm. hadn't won a World Series for a long time, like more than a hundred years or so. Mm-hmm. And they finally did. And then once they won it, they won like two more, like in the next five years. And somebody said, all you Boston fans that are, that are so happy about this, you've become what you hate. You've become <laughs> the New York Yankees. Oh man, in Boston, those are fighting words. Exactly. And that's <laughs> to me, like what you're getting at with the whole fundamentalist versus shit. I just lost my train of thought, but the fundamental. No, but yeah, but the, yeah. the fundamentals, religious fundamentalists ver- and, and the atheist fundamentalists yes, yes, copying yes. them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You become what you hate. Well, people always become what they hate. That's one of the reasons it's not a good idea to spend a lot of time wallowing in hate. Right. And for sure. So. Let's go back to basics here just for a moment. I know the the folks who listen to this show are obviously into the occult and the topics that comprise it. But in the spirit of your book, let's take a moment and define what the occult actually is and give some basic... <laughs> oh, that, that, <laughs> in a moment. That's a nice trick. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Okay. Basic, basically, the word occult means hidden. That's, that's simply what the word means. And... Back in the Renaissance, people would talk about the occult philosophy, the hidden philosophy, the philosophy of secret things. It was a, it was a polite way of talking about magic, basically. But we can think of, occult, of the occult as the rejected knowledge of the Western world, the knowledge that our culture doesn't want to talk about, that it doesn't want to think about. And that includes a bunch of stuff, includes quite a range of stuff, some of which doesn't necessarily have anything to do with each other. But it's simply that's, that's the way it's worked out that all these things have ended up being chucked into the dumpster. And to, you know, people being people, the people who were involved in astrology ended up talking to the folks who were into ritual magic, and they ended up talking to the folks who were into tarot cards. And, you know, when, when, you, when you're all uh, outcasts, you're all on the outside looking in, who are you going to socialize with? So what happened pretty soon is that the magicians started learning something about astrology, and the tarot card readers were learning some magic, and everybody just kind of wove it together into a single pattern. So we have this thing called occultism now. We have these traditions that started out as completely unrelated things, and over a period of many, many centuries, when they were consigned to the outer darkness with wailing and gnashing of teeth and so on, they got woven together into a single system of thought. So that's what occultism is. It's what happened when people who were, who were chased out and who were you know, run out of town on a rail, basically, sat down together and decided to, to, to swap some stories and, and make a pot of soup together. <laughs> and it's, the thing is, what started out as this very diffuse, very vague you know, sort of uh, heaping together of things has become a really interesting way of looking at the world, set of tools, ultimately a way of life. And it works. It's something that people, that people for many, many centuries now have gotten into and have found very satisfying, very meaningful. My book tries to give a really brief introduction to that, but you know, there's, there's a lot out there. Yeah, you mentioned uh, magic, astrology, tarot. I mean, these are just a, a few of the topics that comprise yeah. the occult. What are some other ones, some, some lesser known ones that people might be okay. interested in? One that is not, I don't know if it's lesser known, but it's one that's massively misunderstood is alchemy. Okay, you say alchemy, people say, oh, you mean turning lead into gold. No, not necessarily. Alchemy is an entire system of sciences. They're all kinds, and this is another of these things, it was its own thing, um, and it's kind of blended into occultism generally. It's a whole, basically, alchemy is the art of, trans- of transmuting substances. You can take any substance, whether it's material substances, whether it's spiritual substances, whether it's your mind, and you can use the alchemical method in various ways to transmute it, to make it something that, something, something that works better. It's, you know, the, so you've got that. Um, you've got sacred geometry. That's become kind of mildly famous these days after some of those Dan Brown novels. 
I mean, most of the people I know who are good at sacred geometry, by the way, hated math in high school. So if our listeners <laughs> are going, oh, my God, not mathematics, relax. This is the stuff that makes sense. And there's, there are some good books about sacred geometry. Basically, you can look at geometrical form. You can use it as a symbolism, as things from, to meditate on, as ways to understand the world. It's its own philosophy and system. Very deep stuff. There are lots of other ways of divination. Um, we think of astrology and tarot as two ways. Divination, people say fortune-telling. That's kind of like, you know, for divination is to fortune telling what a good relationship is to um, prostitution. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, divination is best done for yourself. It is a way of developing your own intuitive capacities. Um, you can share it with other people, and it, you know, it's 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 a good relationship. Fortune telling is done for pay, and it's about what you get for pay in another context too. But there are many different methods of doing that, and all of them focus on ways to develop your own intuitive perceptions. So that, I mean, ultimately, when you've done a lot of divination for many years, you don't have to, you don't need the cards anymore. You don't need any of these tools anymore. You simply learned how to intuit things and sense the flow of events. There's a range of other stuff. But those are, those are some, those are some good basic examples of some of the things that have gotten involved. Um, there are, there are actually martial arts that are heavily involved in the culture. Mm-hmm. There are some Asian ones. There are a few Western ones that survive in fragmentary form. But there's, the thing is, there's a whole world of possibilities out there. Once you realize the world is not as stupid as the media claims it is, that it's well, not just lumps of batter lying around going duh at you, okay, then the possibilities open up and you can start to have fun. Well, back to your comment about fortune telling. If if fortune telling mm-hmm. is just just for pay, what do you? What are all these astrologers and tarot card readers doing, trying to take my money all the time? <laughs> now the thing is. It's not unreasonable if you're going to if you now if you're going to hire somebody to do the work of interpreting a, a, a natal chart or something like that, you probably need to chip in some money so they can pay their bills. But if you talk any good astrologers can say, look, this is not fortune telling. I'm not going to tell you what's going to happen to you. We're going to work together to understand your chart so you can understand yourself better and you can understand your possibilities better. And then it's something, frankly, a lot closer to a good to spending time with a good counselor or a good psychotherapist. But yeah, there's a lot of people out there who, you know, they, they, will, they will take your money and they will feed you, typically they'll feed you what's called a cold reading pattern, which is just a line, they, they have it memorized, they can say it very impressively, so it sounds really deep and profound, but it's the same line that they're giving to every single person who comes in the door. They're watching your responses and seeing what makes you perk up because that way they can adjust it later. But it's just a way to get you to come back and spend more money on them. Hmm. And this is why, if you're going to do tarot card, if you're if you're going to frequent tarot card readers, let's say, if you want to um, work with astrologer, you need to learn something about the art yourself. So you're not just you're you're not just you know a lamb going to the slaughter, because if you know your way around tarot cards, you can tell very quickly if the person you're you're who's reading who's reading doing a card reading for you actually is doing a card reading, or if they're just doing cold, a cold reading pattern line at you. Right. If you're, you know, if you know your way around astrology, you can talk with the astrologer and say, yeah, well, I know that, you know, the, having Sun and Aquarius there, that shouldn't that do that? They can go, yeah, yeah, but look at how it trines Saturn here, and da da da. You can have a great conversation. I, I don't know, I don't know. This is a general rule, but I know for myself and for some astrologers that I know, having somebody, having a client who actually knows something about astrology is a delight because you don't have to do everything in baby talk. You can actually talk with them, share the process with them, process discovery, and everyone has a better time and the results are usually better too. Definitely, yeah. And one of the other uh, major components of the occult is the philosophical aspect of it. And my introduction to that was actually through hermeticism. That's how I got into the occult in general. It was through that path. Where did you Where did you run into hermeticism? What 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 form of it was there? A particular book or something? I actually uh, am a fan of a certain band, and they Which use one? a uh, tool. T O O L. Okay, know if yeah. You heard of them? Yeah. But yeah, they use a lot of uh, occult symbology in their artwork and I didn't stage know that. shows. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so looking, following them, looking into what they were doing, that got you interested in hermeticism. Yeah, yeah. Wait, they okay. were they were using like uh, some symbols from John D. Uh, mm-hmm. So that led me to John D. Obviously, and then I, I mm-hmm. sort of tumbled down the John D. rabbit hole for a little while, and then I got into hermeticism. Oh, 
that's a that's a that's a rabbit hole that goes down quite a ways. Yeah. Yes, yes, it is for sure. So we've talked about hermeticism on this show, but a, a couple of things we haven't but, gotten too deep into are the other two major philosophical components of the occult, and that's uh, Neoplatonism and the Kabbalah. I was wondering if you could just mm-hmm. give us a crash course on those two philosophical concepts. A crash course on oh, good. Okay, in both cases, we're talking really complex, really rich really symbolically rich systems of thinking and um, you know anything less than a couple of years of close study you're not going to really get it because, you know this is deep stuff seriously if you want to study these things it's great it will do you a lot of good you will learn an enormous amount of, about yourself in the universe and it will take you about as much effort as getting a bachelor's degree nobody said it had to be easy mm-hmm. so neoplaton the basic idea okay neoplatonism that's that came out of greek philosophy that as, as Greek philosophers back in ancient times began wrestling with the exper- things like spiritual experiences and so on, and started factoring that in. The idea of Neoplatonism is that there's, there are these levels of being, okay? So that the material, what we call the material world, what scientists says is the only reality, the last, the lowest level of being, and there are other levels of being that come before that. The, the material world is the world of effect. The world's causes is elsewhere. And so what we, do, what we do as we study Neoplatonism is we learn to get a sense of how the world unfolds from a primal unity through these various levels of cascading down these levels of being and comes into manifestation in the material world around us. That has a lot to do with occultism, of course, because if you're a mage, if, you're practicing, if you practice magic, okay, you're trying to tap into those currents of descending energy, and you say, okay, I want a little more of this one, please, if you don't mind, wait, to pull your life this way, to pull your life that way, or to affect other people in various constructive ways. Okay, that's Neoplatonism in the smallest possible nutshell. Okay, the Kabbalah. Um, similar situation, but we're on, in a different culture. We're in, we're in the culture of Judaism. Okay, we have the Jewish people who are wrestling with um, their own very, very old scriptures and things like that, and trying to take a bunch of writings that were written down, you know, by a bunch of desert tribesmen who were, you know, who had just recently become literate many thousands of years ago. And how do you make sense of these if you live in a complex urban society? You have some philosophical sophistication. You've learned a lot more than desert nomads knew in the year 2000 BC or something. You start getting into symbolism. You start saying, okay, what does that mean? You know, when Moses stops, stops at this, um, uh, you know, this particular place with, on, during the Exodus and there are seven wells there, could the number seven mean something? And they got into it. And what happened, of course, because they were adding in the spiritual practices, they were practicing meditation, they were practicing ritual, they started to get in tune with the same kind of experiences the Neoplatonists were having. And so they ended up with a similar system of levels, which the ten sephiroth, as they're called, are the ten levels of being from the primal unity down to the material world. This may sound familiar. It should. And so there's this. There's one whole branch of the Kabbalah which is entirely about um, how to interpret the Bible so it actually makes sense. And then there are other branches that do various things, and depending on which on what your interests are, there again you can keep busy on that for a very long time. But those are kind of those are two broad things. And then of course you know you mentioned Hermeticism, that ultimately comes out of Egyptian tradition, and again the same thing. You've got that same sense of an ultimate unity out of which everything unfolds, the same sense of influence is cascading down the levels, taking on more and more form until they finally ground out in the material plane in the world that we know. And so this is why Neoplatonists and Kabbalists and Hermeticists, as early as as the beginning of the Renaissance, were already saying, you know, we're talking about the same thing, aren't we? And so you have modern occultism, you have the occultism that came out out of the end of the Renaissance, where you're seeing all three of these systems blended together. And, mm. you know, people who are, the Hermetic, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn is a great example. They did a lot of Kabbalah. They did huge amounts of Kabbalah, even though they were primarily a Hermetic organization. Why? Because there were aspects of the Kabbalistic tradition that helped fill in gaps in, her, in the Hermetic tradition. You can also bring Neoplatonism into the same thing and fill in more gaps. And that's one of the things that's been happening over the last three centuries. The people have been taking these different traditions and saying, okay, if we take this and this and this, we, we've got this common pattern, we meld all these together, and then it all makes sense. And then you can do things with it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I should back up just a moment. You, sure. you asked me if I had discovered Hermeticism through a book, and 
while I did stumble across the music first, like, you know, with the symbols of, of this band, mm-hmm. that also mm-hmm. led me to, are you familiar with the fiction author John Crowley? Oh, good heavens, yes. <laughs> okay, so, so which, which was the book of his that blew your mind open? Well, the first thing that I read was The Egypt Cycle, that series of four oh, books. Oh, wow. Oh, that must have been marvelous. Yes, I've, uh, John Crowley is an amazing writer. I love his stuff. Um, I have been reading him since he first got into print. And, oh my, that, that must have been an absolutely delightful introduction to the concepts because he, he, know, he knows this stuff extremely well. Yeah, he certainly and, does. Yeah. You, you've, you've read Little Big, right? Yeah, yeah, that was the second. Well, I consider the Egypt Cycle Waltz four books, one story. So yeah. I always, yeah, I, like, is, I always say is. that's yeah. the first story that I read. But yes, I read a little big after that. Uh-huh. Actually, because that that actually, of course, bounces back to another branch of the occult tradition that a lot of people don't know about now, which is the art of memory. Which, mm-hmm. of course, little big runs all the way through. That's that's the magic that Ariel Hawksquill uses that makes her the greatest mage of that age of the world and all that. And in fact. I had, one of the reasons I adore that book so much, I've actually used the art of memory extensively. When I went back to college in the, in the early 1990s to finish my degree, I didn't take notes. I didn't have to take notes. I studied the art of memory, and so I you know, finished with a very high GPA and graduated a magna cum laude without ever taking a note on paper. I didn't need to. The art of memory is that good. But John Crowley's work on that really helped publicize that, and so, among other things, there's been some really good books recently on the art of memory. Yeah, and uh, I should tell you, mm-hmm. John, my first guest was one John Crowley. I interviewed him. He was wow. my first guest on this show. Okay, so, I'm going to go through a genuine fanboy moment here, okay? <laughs> yeah, and the whole point of me getting in touch with him was, one, I mean, as a total fanboy, I wanted to just talk to him because uh-huh. he's really the guy that, that opened this door for me through his, his, his uh-huh. fiction. But he'd also uh-huh. put out a translation of The Chemical Wedding last year. Did you see that? No, I didn't. Wow. Okay, that will be, that will be a trip. Now, um, Jocelyn Godwin's translation of The Chemical Wedding and Christian Rosenkreutz is really good. And as a, scholar, as a scholarly work, it's a serious piece of work. But mm-hmm. I'm certainly going to see what John, Crow- John Crowley has done with it. That will be so cool. Yeah, okay, yeah. Thank, uh, thank you. You have made my evening. <laughs> no problem. So, you know, you mentioned the occult book is full of a hundred anecdotes from the history of the mm-hmm. occult. I'm curious, let's go back to the very beginning of the occult in the West. I think this starts with mm-hmm. Pythagoras, right? It starts with Pythagoras. That's that's where that's where it all got underway. He's the guy who went to Egypt. Basically, in his lifetime, the Greeks had you know, trade and, and political connection with, with what was left of Egypt, because, because ancient Egypt was basically on its last legs at that point. And Pythagoras was, was, you know, went there and managed to talk his way into being accepted as a student in one of the mystery temples down in Thebes, and went through their whole system of initiation. And then he, he did some more traveling and, and took various mystery initiations in various places. And then, came, then he, he came back to the Greek world and settled down and opened a school. And basically, he's the first person we know about who taught something that more or less corresponds to occultism in the Western world. I mean, of course, there had been magic being practiced before. Then, of course, there had been divination, all this kind of stuff. But as a complete system... As a system of personal development and philosophy and practice, he seems to be the, certainly he's the oldest one we know about. And so, yeah, he's the, he's the start of the thing. If, if you see the Western world, as most people do, as beginning in ancient Greece and sort of unfolding from there, he's the, he's the starting point. Yeah, he's obviously a famous mathematician, and people know him for mm-hmm. his, his, his famous theorem, right? But mm-hmm. how does the theorem tie into maybe some sacred geometrical <laughs> teachings? Oh, how many hours do you have? Uh, <laughs> basically, one of the things about sacred, one of the core elements of sacred geometry, and one of the things that makes it a really good tool to think with, is that it relates, okay, uh, two and a half dollar word here, it deals with incommensurability. Now, that really long word means basically when you have two things where there's no common measure between them, the classic example is the circumference of a circle and the diameter of a circle. We all know pi, okay? 3.1415927 and so off to infinity. There's no way that you can have a circle with a fin- that has a finite number of units around the circumference and a finite number of the same units across the diameter. 
This is true of a lot of things. If you have a square, okay, the side of the square, no matter what the side of the square is, the diagonal is going to be um, an, ir an irrational number, a number that you can't calculate. You can draw it geometrically perfectly. The thing is, most, so much of our lives are dominated by things that can be represented by that kind of incommensurable experience. We look at the relation between matter and spirit. We look at the relationship between mind and body. There are these weird mismatches or apparent mismatches. And sacred geometry shows us that there are ways to bridge the gap. And the Pythagorean theorem was one of the, one of the sort of the mathematical demonstrations that something that looks completely irrational, you can actually make it rational. You can make sense of it. You can understand it. And so that's kind of how that fits in. There's a lot more. Um, sacred geometry is incredibly rich. There's a lot of material. I, I've, I've, done, I've done some writing on that subject. I, I need to do a couple of books on it. Yeah, I'm quite sure you could probably do more than that if you wanted to. But uh, <laughs> tell me, mm -hmm. you know, of the hundred anecdotes in here, I mean, I, like, obviously, they're all important. They're all pivotal in the history of the occult. But could we pick out a couple here that really stand out to you as events that, well, if this didn't happen, then the occult tradition as we know it wouldn't be what it is? Okay, we can look at the, the time of the Emperor Julian, the last pagan emperor of Rome. Because in the in the pagan Roman world, magic wasn't a big deal. I mean, people it it could be legal. there were occasionally legal pra legal difficulties with it and so on, but lots of people did that kind of thing. And it was after Christianity took over that that really became a problem. So if if Julian had not died when he did, if he had been able to preserve Rome's pagan standing, things might have been very different. Okay, another significant event here is um, 1736 when the last laws against witchcraft were changed so that people in England, so people could no longer be burned at the stake or hanged for practicing magic. For a very long time, if you practiced magic and you were caught, they could kill you, and they did. They killed a lot of people. That finally went away, in, in so far permanently, in 1736. See, another one would be Eliphas Levy. We're at 1855 now, the publication of The Doctrine and Ritual of High Magic, which was the book that launched the modern occult revival. It so happens that we've done a new, a new translation of Levy's book, and it's, now, it's, it's readily available now pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so that was the book that really showed people that this, all this magic stuff, all this you know, supposed you know, medieval superstition, blah, 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 actually had a huge amount of wisdom and, and meaning to it. So those are just some, some important points in the history of occultism. Right. You know, I had uh, noted here some of the some of the anecdotes that I personally either wasn't familiar with or just didn't know a lot mm -hmm. about. And I go was ahead. wondering if, yeah, I was going to say, so I want to go back to the, the first century BCE and talk about, or if you could tell us uh, the story of Miriam the alchemist or Mary the mm -hmm. Jewess of Alexandria. Yeah, yeah exactly. I wasn't too familiar yeah. with her. Yeah, Mir yeah, Miriam the alchemist, we don't know a great deal about her. She was Jewish. Obviously, she was a woman. She was one of the most important early alchemists there was. She was the inv um, an inventor of important pieces of alchemical equipment. She wrote significant works. She lived in Alexandria, which in Egypt, which was the, uh, the bubbling cauldron of alchemical thought in those days. It was the place you went if you wanted to get into the alchemy seriously. And so, um, yeah, she was this, this massively important figure. One of the things that came out of, of her career was precisely that in the occult community, the attitudes toward women were much less negative than they were in mainstream society. People were going, okay, you know, if she could be this immensely important alchemist, obviously, you know, this notion that women are intellectually inferior is crap, as of course it is. And so she had, she had an immense, everybody who uses a double boiler, you know, the, the cooking implement where mm -hmm. you have a yeah. pan full of water, another pan on top of it, in French, a bain-marie, Marie's bath, okay? She invented that. You're using a piece of alchemical, you know, to make that chocolate fondue, you're using a piece of <laughs> alchemical equipment that Miriam the alchemist invented back in Alexandria in the first century B.C. Is that why fondue is so good? Man, all right. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, <laughs> okay, hey, it's, al it's alchemical stuff, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, so <laughs> a couple other things. You are more familiar with this than you give away in the book here, but in 1630, the Academy of the Sword, which I know you've written an entire... The yeah, that's, that's such a... I translated it. Yeah, I was going to say, was... that's such a great, great story, too. Yeah, um, basically, Gerard Thibault, he was the Bruce Lee of, Renaissance, of Renaissance, late Renaissance Europe. This was basically, he was a, he was, he was a kid from, from what's now Belgium, and he, his health was not good. 
he I, he had I'm not I don't think anyone really knows what was what was wrong with his health, but he was never healthy and he he died relatively young. But in order to build his health, his dad got him started doing fencing lessons, swordsmanship lessons, and he was really good at it. And so eventually his his family was in the wool trade and they got a lot of wool from the southern end of Spain, so they arranged to send him down there. Of course, the climate's a little better, but also that was the hotbed of rapier fencing. Now, rapier is not like a fencing foil. It's longer, it's stiffer, it's basically a shish kebab iron, and it is lethal. And that was the sword that was commonly used in those days. So young Gerard Thibault goes down there to Spain, um, to San Lucar de Barrameda, the, the hotbed of swordsmanship, but he studies with these amazing Spanish swordmasters. And then after about 10 years, he came back to Belgium and enrolled in one of the you know perfectly ordinary contests. They had these you know sort of tournaments, right? And he kicked everybody's butt. Bang, 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 bang. Everyone's going, whoa. And so uh, Prince William of Orange, who was the head, the, the, um, head of state of, of the Netherlands at that time, said, okay, kid, come here. Show us what you can do. And he did this three-day-long demonstration where he was saying, okay, I'll take on anyone. Come here. And the best swordsmen in that whole end of Europe came to cross swords with him and ended up flat on their butts. So he proceeded to start work on this book, like how to mean this space. He had students by that time, obviously. People were going, I want to know what you can how you do that. And he wrote what is the most complex, most lavishly illustrated, most comp- informative book on swordsmanship ever written. And the thing that most people don't realize, things that I don't think more than a very few people realized until I got to work on the translation, it's all based on sacred geometry. Every bit of it. And so what we have here is a Renaissance magical martial art. The book was published, you know, he died in 1629. It still wasn't actually finished. It was published as far as it got in 1630. It was very popular for a while and then kind of faded out because that's when the, you know, the Renaissance occultism got stomped. You recall the metaphor in the first book of John Crowley's Tetralogy, as though this vast machinery of glass and bronze had been stomped and oh, flung yeah. into the gutter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what he, he's right. Crowley is absolutely right. That's what happened in the 17th century. This entire immense structure of Renaissance occultism got the crap stomped out of it, and it got um, you know, and people just. All the all the you know, the media of the time turned against it. The, gov- the governments and the religious and, and the people who wanted to save it could only save so much because there was only so many people. There weren't that many people. There you had to get it down to something you could pass on in secrecy, in little lodges and little groups of students. And so a huge amount of stuff simply fell by the way I said completely. And Thibault's system was one of them was one of the pieces that did not. That was one of the one of those big fragments of glass and bronze that ended up in the gutter being stomped. And I, it was frankly an honor for me to translate that and get it back into circulation because there are now people practicing that kind of swordsmanship. So you said it's based on sacred geometry. It's based Is, on sacred geometry, yeah. Are, like, how? Like, are you talking about like the movements are or what? All the movements, all the footwork, the angles, the swords. Um, Repair fencing is the most geometrical art you can imagine. Your sword is basically a straight line, right? It's forming an angle with the other guy's sword when you block it. It's penetrating a surface of the other guy's body. Every angle, every moment of pressure, every step, every twist of the body, it's all done by geometry. It all means things. When, when, I was, when I was first working on the translation, I got the first eight chapters done. I did it as a little spiral-bound publication. And I put, you know, just sold it by word of mouth. And all of a sudden, I had like 200 sales because there were a couple of folks in Seattle who were very much into repair fencing who got this thing and went, holy crap, I know how to use that, and proceeded to just start cleaning up the field using Thibault's techniques against other people and you know, just knocking out one person after another. It's the stuff works. That's crazy. Man. And this is the yeah. thing. This is the thing about occultism. People say, "Oh, it's all this airy fairy pie in the sky." No, it isn't. It, th- there's a thing that we say in a lot of occult circles. This <clears throat> works, and it does. Yeah, yeah, and you can say shit if you want to. But <laughs> okay. I, I know that. I suppose so. I... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so there you are. This yeah. shit works. This shit. Just... <laughs> it does. <laughs> Yeah. So okay. So I also want to talk about two more things before we get out of here. The first thing is, uh, and this can be a little bit briefer, but one of the interesting mm-hmm. anecdotes that I that I found in here was a a group that I actually stumbled across recently on my own. Seventeen forty six, the founding of the Hellfire Club. 
Uh-huh. This, is, yeah. this is still not a group I know much about, but I do find it interesting <laughs> that their club motto was do what thou wilt. People will be familiar with oh, that yeah. from some other stuff. Uh, yeah, exactly. No, Alistair Crowley plagiarized it, of course. Yeah, did you know Ben Franklin was a member? The the founding father, the man was an the man was an old latch, okay? He was an impressive <laughs> guy in his own way, but he had he had his appetites. He liked to drink and he liked to you know, he liked to chase tail. And he now he was by all accounts very polite about it. Was not interested in tail that wasn't willing. But there were a lot. There was a lot. Of, <laughs> there were a lot of willing. A uh, lot of attractive women who were very interested in uh, spending some time with 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 old Ben. Well, um, uh, so John he had a good time, and hopefully so did they. Go ahead. I was going to say Ben was the original multi potentialite, <laughs> if you remember. <laughs> Oh yeah, no. He was he was the Renaissance man's Renaissance. Man's <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. So Go that's ahead. A, yeah the Hellfire Club. That that's kind of that's kind of fun. It was an organization that was founded by some British noblemen, who were um, you know they were interested. Partly they were interested in having a good time, and partly they they liked to do things that were shocking. We all know this game, you know. And there was there were some people connected to it that had various occult interests. Mostly it wasn't occultism. Mostly it was drinking and whoring. But it played a very large role in kind of creating the modern notion of the evil Satanist who's constantly, you know, chasing tail and, and getting drunk and things like that. Because Sir Francis Dashwood and the other people who founded the Hellfire Club, obviously they like to drink, they like to chase tail, and they um, liked people to think of them as really, really evil. Mm-hmm. And Aleister Crowley ended up copying them in a lot of ways less successfully. Right. That's the thing that really stood out to me was that their club motto is exactly what, you know, you read in the Book of the mm-hmm. Law. The last thing that I want to touch on here before we go took place mm-hmm. in 1798 when the Druids started to celebrate the autumn equinox. This mm-hmm. ties in with what I wanted to talk about with the Colbrin. Colbrin? Right? Mean, you're, yeah, you're, Colbrin. Yeah. Colbrin. Yeah, yeah. yeah Again, so this as, t- as I mentioned yeah. earlier, that's, we're, <laughs> right. we're probably going to have to do that one on, on uh, discussing the Colbrin another night at this point because that's okay. that in itself is kind of a long story. But the really short form is that, yeah, 1798, pagan nature worship in the middle of London. You don't usually think of, you know, 18th century England, but in fact it was going on. Events, you know, it, they were going through something rather a little like the 60s in their own way. But the thing is, this has been going on for a very long time. That was the, I mean, the rude revival actually got going in the early 1700s. The, the sort of the, the internal records that we have suggested the first organization that got together got together around 1717, so almost exactly 300 years ago. But it was very quiet for a long time because there were laws that made it really difficult to practice um, non-Christian religions in those days. But yeah, there was a guy named Edward Williams, went by uh, the pen name Yolo Morganog in Welsh, who literally organized solstice and equinox rituals right in the middle of London, right out in the, as, as Drew would say, in the face of the sun, the eye of light, right out in front of everybody, and, and got away with it. Yeah, well, I know that the Colburn alphabet is is a whole other show by itself, but I was just curious mm-hmm. if, we, if we could maybe just drop like a little teaser because oh, I sure. I read the book in the past week just because I've been meaning to read it and just haven't gotten around to it, and I thought, well, shit, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm going to talk to you. I might as well see if I could get get through this. Oh, yeah. So um, the the really the really fast version of the Colburn. Okay, it's an alphabet of 24 letters. It was used. Um, back in the in the early days of the Druid revival, it was part of the Druid teachings in those days. Um, Yolo Morgano, Edward Williams, the guy I was talking about a moment ago, he's the guy who introduced it. He claimed to have gotten it from ancient sources. Nobody's found the ancient sources. He may have made it up, which doesn't mean it doesn't work. Okay, a lot of people who use it these days use it like runes. You know, the the Elder Futark is has the main the the version of the runes is most popular these days. Also has twenty four letters, and so it's like doing a rune reading. You know, you draw out a certain number of of cauldron letters and interpret them. It has various other uses and so on. It ties into druid philosophy. It ties into certain kinds of occultism and so on. But it's just it, it comes out of Welsh tradition. It comes out of the Welsh the Welsh end of the druid revival, and it comes out of the. I mean, Yolo was a really weird cat. He was a very strange person. He had a, an astonishing imagination. He was a genius in his own way. He also used one whale of a lot of opium. And so, you know, <laughs> basically we're talking about a brilliant poet with a drug problem. And things got very interesting wherever he was. Yeah, and I just want to throw this out there too. You say that it's a, it's a useful divination tool. What particularly mm-hmm. makes it so useful? 
one of the things that, that sets it apart from many other things is that each of the letters derives its symbolism actually from its sound. Each letter represents a process or, a, if you will, a stage of flow, a pattern of movement. And so where some, some oracles are really static, it's this thing, that thing, the other thing. Here with the cauldron, you're constantly dealing with, okay, you know, the, this one means, the, the letter A, for example, means the equivalent of A, if you will. It means flowing straight ahead. It means just, you know, continue along the path you're going. It can also mean things in a different position. It means in a reading, things, you know, things will continue going the way they're going. This other one, E, equivalent to the letter E, represents um, breakage or disruption. It's something being broken off, something being stopped or confused or so on. And that's, that's if you will, the opposite thing. That's saying, don't keep on doing what you're doing. Or in the different context, things are going to go haywire if you keep on trying to go this way. Or, you know, things are just going to go, hey, you're going to have to deal with it. Again, depending on the context of the reading. It's all about process. It's all about flow. And that makes it really useful if you're trying to deal with everyday questions for real life. I did the uh, equivalent of binging this book the past, like, <laughs> two days because I was like, I'm just going to try to get it in. So I, I did. I actually just yeah. finished it last night. So it, it, cool. it's fascinating. Well, Seriously, take the time to make yourself a set of cold, whether you do it cards or sticks or whatever, or rocks mm -hmm. with the cauldron on it, what have you. Make yourself a cauldron set and try doing some readings. You will find that it's a really effective oracle, okay. and especially it's really good for just, just ordinary questions of daily life. How should I deal with, you know, I, you know, I have to deal with a meeting with the boss today. What should I do? And here's saying, you know, you get something that comes up saying, go really slow, make sure of your ground. You know, things, there's, there's all kinds of there's stuff going on here you don't know about. Be careful. And then you go in and do that, and you're fine. So it's, uh, my experience with it has been very positive. So I think, I think it's definitely something. Give it a try. I don't think you'll regret it. For sure, yeah. I had a positive experience reading it. I can't imagine that it would treat me Sweet. not so well if I, if I did it. Now, yeah. I know that you stopped doing your Archdruid Report blog. Are, are you blogging anywhere else currently? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, my, my, the current blog is ecosophia.net, E C O. S-O-P-H-I-A dot net. I hiatus from the Archdruid Report, and then I closed that down because the huge, um, com the huge software, et cetera, internet company that owns that pla the platform it was on was loading on all kinds of security features that are designed to harp. Paid for, and it's now up and running. John, you actually cut out there, so I don't know what okay. happened, but that's fine. We're we're we're, we're wrapping <laughs> up here, anyways. But uh, hey, hey, as soon as you started talking about the old plat or the about the old platform, well, yeah, let's, let's try. Let's let's see what happens if I can mention the really big software company, the yes. uh, an internet company. Are you still hearing me? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, they, they were they were making it, they they were adding all of these upgrades that made it extremely difficult to actually continue to use their service. And I think it's because they were they were doing the upgrade to try to harvest data. Okay, yeah, I I missed that part. So <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. That, well, that's funny. <laughs> they're, yeah. I guess they're doing a good job. But yeah, absolutely. At any rate, yeah, that's that's basically the situation. And um, so, but I shut down I shut down that blog and have reopened the one at ecosophia.net, which is covering many of the same things. It is a we're having lively conversations. And in fact, once a month these days, I'm doing an open post, which is kind of ask me anything. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, it's and people are asking me anything. Oh, I mean, I've got some amazing <laughs> questions. <laughs> awesome, yeah. I will definitely link to that blog uh, in the show notes cool. here for people that are interested. John Michael Greer, thanks for being here, man. I really do appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Cool, man. Cool, cool, cool. My thanks again to John Michael Greer. I fucking love that dude. I'll tell you what, I thought the best part of that conversation was us just gushing over John Crowley's work. It's nice to meet people who appreciate the same art that you do, which actually gave me an idea that maybe, well, it gave me an idea, and I'll leave it at that. Anyway, please do check out John's work. It's impressive, and it's all linked in the show notes. And please do check out oldculturepodcast.com slash support. If you got some spare change lying around and you appreciate what we're doing here, hit up that link. There's a couple options for monetary donations through PayPal or Bitcoin, or if you can, just drop the show a nice review on iTunes. Pull it open on there, click five stars. It's super easy. Whatever you can do, I appreciate it. Five dollars or five stars, it all helps. Regardless, you guys kick ass, and I am thankful for each and every one of you. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy your time with your families, and don't forget to love yourself. Think for yourself. Question authority. 
and call your local congressman and tell him that you support net neutrality. Please rewind this cassette.